So first, I'd like to thank you for inviting me. I am very, very, very excited to be here tonight. Um, and before I get started, I want to know how many people here have actually gone to Chicago Public Library? Oh my god. Well, OK then. There might not be as much I need to talk about, because it sounds like you may know a lot more than I thought. OK. So um, today I was asked to talk about not only Chicago Public Library, but how did I actually become the chief of technology content and innovation for Chicago Public Library? And it's kind of an interesting path that I took to get here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that path, and then I'll talk about my role and what I'm doing at Chicago Public Library. So first, I am a librarian, and I'm also a technologist. But um, somebody asked me, how do you really identify yourself? And I realized that whenever I have to fill out a federal document or go through customs, I always say that I'm a librarian. So I guess I would say I'm a librarian first and a technologist second. But um, I have been doing technology work um, as long as I've actually been a librarian. I got my library degree in 1997 from, I'm sorry, in 2011 from the um, University of Pittsburgh. Um, I, no, actually, that should be one typo already. So it was 1997. Um, I also have a master's of um, library, uh, learning and organizational change from Northwestern University, which I got in 2011. But my career started out in, um, at Wright State University Library, and um, I've been doing that since 1998. So I've been doing, I've been the librarian thing since as soon as I went to library school right after I graduated from undergraduate. So I'm kind of unusual in that. A lot of librarians go into this job as a second career. I did this as my first career. And I kind of am, I guess you would say, the accidental technologist. And I kind of liken my career to the road not taken um, by the, um, the Robert Frost poem. He's like, you know, you have like these two paths that you could have taken, and I thought I was gonna be a children's librarian. And lo and behold, some things happened, and I ended up actually going into technology. Um, how did that happen? Well, I first thought I was gonna be an English major and get my PhD in English. And then I realized, really thinking about it, when I was a senior in college, you really can't make much money um, as a PhD um, in literature, right? And so I know I needed a better job career path. I didn't know that you could actually become a librarian. Like, I didn't know what was involved in that. And I was working for Barnes & Noble and B. Dalton's when I was in college. And I actually worked with a couple of people who were getting their library degree when I worked there. And they talked me into it. And so I decided to explore it, really liked it, talked to a whole bunch of librarians, and decided it was a path for me. So I went to the University of Pittsburgh. And I chose the University of Pittsburgh because I thought I wanted to be a children's librarian. And I went there because they had the preeminent children's librarian program in the United States. If I would have known I was going into technology, I would have actually gone to University of Illinois Urbana or Michigan. But alas, I had thought I was going to be a children's librarian. Unfortunately, I had an unfortunate encounter with the um, head of the children's uh, literature department at the University of Pittsburgh. We had a heated debate about these books called Goosebumps. I don't know if any of you remember these from your childhood. Right. I thought they were the gateway drug to reading and loved them as a children's um, bookseller. Um, my teacher thought they were all things that were horrible. And after that, I knew I could not explore the path of a children's librarian at University of Pittsburgh. If I was going to do it, I was going to have to go someplace else. God bless my um, administrator, who was also my advisor. And she's like, you have a huge, a very high aptitude for technology. You scored really well on the entrance exam. When it came to technology, you're helping everybody with their technology. I really think you need to take a tech class. So I did, and with the help of Chris Tomer, who was my first uh, technology teacher at the University of Pittsburgh, um, my path was, was set. I, I was totally hooked on it and decided to make that my path in librarianship. I then went to Wright State University Libraries. That was my first job, and this, I was still straddling that tech and librarian role. I was a half-time web administrator. I was a half-time reference librarian. And that was when I really learned that I actually wanted to be the technologist full time and not actually do what people would consider more of the traditional librarian role. So doing reference, doing instruction. I was teaching actually credited courses at this point uh, for the university. And I really, the thing that really got me jazzed when I got out of bed in the morning was figuring out how to work with technology and how to bring services to the students better with the technology platforms that we had in the library. And so my career was kind of set. Um, a job came open at Northwestern University's library at the Galter Health Sciences Library. It's in Chicago. Um, I, wanted to I wanted to move to Chicago. This job came open. I applied. And I became, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost afraid to admit this, a cold fusion programmer. Um, 
I know. Um, so Cold Fusion was a huge programming language that was used in medical schools um, in the 90s. Um, and I had learned it when I was in school and um, I'd kept up with it and they needed one. So that's actually how I got started really in the tech field was actually um, my first programming language was PHP, I mean not PHP, was Perl, then Cold Fusion, then PHP, and then, um, oh my God, Ruby on Rails. Um, but I actually haven't programmed in over 10 years, so I hope you don't hold that against me. I moved into uh, management and that kind of left my programming world behind. It's hard to be a manager, oversee a lot of system-wide programs, as well as, pro as, well as actually you know, program typing um, on the side. So I kind of had to give it up because I just wasn't keeping up with the skill set. Um, while I was at Northwestern, I also was lucky enough to become the president of the Library and Information Technology Association. I had a wonderful time doing that. I learned a lot. Um, I really felt like at Northwestern, I learned how to be a really good manager. I felt like um, being the president of the Library Information Technology Association helped me become a really good leader and become, instead of looking at the day-to-day -day management of things, I really started looking at what was the long-term implication of the decisions I was making when it came to technology and the people that I was serving. Um, so it was a wonderful opportunity. I wouldn't give it up for the world. Um, but when I was both at Northwestern and as I was president of the Library Information Technology Association, I was working on a lot of projects or watching a lot of projects, and I was trying to figure out why do good technology projects go bad? I mean, I'm sure all of us have experienced this. There was a great technology idea that we wanted to implement in our institution, and it crashed and burned, right? I'm sure all of us have multiple stories related to this. If you don't, I would love to talk to you about how you ever avoided uh, that pitfall. Um, and I realized, I, got, I found this great quote from somebody who said, don't confuse the strength of your desire for change with the probability of success. I'm an optimist, um, and so I always thought I could will these things into fruition. And I realized I couldn't. And I was trying to figure out, why can't you will a great idea into production and make it successful? And um, I worked academic. So most people that I worked with had at least two or three masters and a few smatterings sometimes of PhDs as well. And so when I was at Northwestern, I knew I needed to get that second master's if I wanted to continue. And so I actually went back to school and I went to um, Northwestern University's School of Education they have a program called the MSLOC. It's the Masters of Learning and Organizational Change. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. Anybody here might actually be um, either in the program now or a graduate. If you haven't, I highly suggest that you check it out. And what this program focuses on is leadership and adult, um, adult learning theory and how you can pull all of this together to make su successful system and cultural change in an organization. And what I realized was, this was probably one of the best experiences I went through as a technologist, is because, um, I don't know about you, but like feelings and emotions aren't really my thing. I like the analytical parts of programming. I like looking at systems and laying out maps and charts and, and planning and organizing. I like the ambiguity of knowing that you have a plan of what's gonna occur and knowing that what you don't know you don't know is always gonna put a wrench in it and you're gonna to have to fly by the seat of your pants for your implementation. I love that feeling, um, but other people don't. And I learned a lot in this program about how to help people navigate the seas of change. Um, and it was probably one of the most um, influential and one of, the, one of the milestones in my life that I think has made me extremely successful now in my role as the director of technology for the Chicago Public Library. If anybody wants to talk about this program, I'm, they are not paying me or anything, shape or form, but if anybody's ever interested in learning more about this, I'd be glad to talk to you about it. So I was at Northwestern for over 10 years. I kind of felt like I had hit a wall. There wasn't a way for me to move up. Um, and so I started looking for new positions. I always thought I'd actually stay in academia. Um, but this job at Chicago Public Library came out, and I swear that if I could have written a job description, this is the job description that I would have written. It was doing the strategy, implementation, and development of IT strategy for the entire Chicago Public Library system. I mean, how incredible is that? It's one of the largest libraries in the United States, depending on what stat you're looking at. We rank anywhere from two to eight. I'll say we're two. Um, we are ranked as one of the best libraries in the world. Um, and so I was thrilled that I got the job. And one of the reasons why I was so thrilled to get this job 
was because I knew I could take everything that I had learned as a programmer, as a librarian, as a person who had been a president of a major association, and a person who had gone through this um, incredible graduate degree program, I could pull all this together and have a system-wide change in libraries when it came to the city of Chicago. I mean, who wouldn't say yes to that? So just in case some of you aren't familiar with this, but I think most of you are, this is uh, CPL's mission. And um, I really resonate with this mission, and it's one of the reasons why I'm actually a librarian. I really believe in what libraries do and who it is that they support. So we welcome and support all people through their entire life in their enjoyment of reading and lifelong learning. And that's what I get to do every single day that I go into the office. Um, we all work together to strive to provide equal access to information, to ideas, and knowledge through books, programs, and other resources. And we believe in the freedom to read, to learn, and to discover. And that's what I try to support every day in my job. Um, here are just some pictures that help inspire me when I'm at the office. I like to show this one just to kind of give you a brief idea of what it is that we do. We provide programs, we have public computing, we do educational and cultural activities. Um, we are here to support people in their learning and we're trying to help people become active and active participants in the 21st century um, economic and all the different, different types of things that are happening now in this century and helping them move beyond and see all their goals come to fruition. Um, in 2014, the library released a strategic plan. I like looking at this. Um, I actually have this usually posted in my office so I can remember every day what it is that I'm doing, but I don't know exactly how to do this. But so the blues, you know, that's like what libraries always do. We might call it something different every four or five years when we redo our strategic plan. But the two major tenets of libraries is that we support access for all. So anybody in the city of Chicago can come in and use our resources and we are never gonna question you about it. And um, we wanna make sure that we do that effectively so that we're providing the services and operations and programs that are gonna help you do what you wanna do on a daily basis. And then the things in the middle, so this nurture learning, supporting economic advancement and strengthening communities, those are the areas that we've decided to focus on right now. So that's part of our strategic plan for the five years. It ends, I think, next year at the end of the year, if I'm not mistaken. It might go into 2020. Um, but this is, these are the areas that might change every strategic plan, but this is what we're focusing on now. Here's a system map, just in case you don't know where we are, but we're in every neighborhood and then some in the city of Chicago. We have over 80 locations and we have over a million uh, users. And um, last year we had 8.5 million people who came in the doors. That number's a little bit lower and that's just because Whitney Young and Woodson were both closed for renovations last year. Usually we're about 10 million people that come through the doors. And there were a couple other branches that closed last year for like two to three months to get what we call refreshes. So um, they, um, the visitor count was a little bit lower but we're usually around an average of 10 million people. How am I doing on time? Great, okay. Um, and then we have, um, we have the branches that are open six days a week, Monday through Friday, and Monday through Saturday. And then we have two regional libraries, Sulzer, which is in the north, Woodson, which is in the south, which reopened in February. If you haven't gone there, I suggest you go check it out. It's fabulous. Um, and then we have the Harold Washington Library Center, which is the library that most people are familiar with, especially probably you guys, because you guys come down here regularly for Shy Hack Night, and we're not that far away. We're only four stops away on the L. So, as I said before, all the, edu like the education that I had, the work that I was doing, the volunteerism that I had done, had all kind of converged and I think um, really came to fruition when I came um, to uh, Chicago Public Library. And I got to put all of these skills to use immediately when I walked in the door. The library had recently made an agreement with a company called Biblio Commons, and we were working with them to develop a new kind of forward-facing, um, innovative, library platform for people to inter in, interact with on our library website. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the old website. It was green, it had, was green and maroon. I, I try not to think about what it looked like anymore. Um, but this is uh, what the current one looks like now. And what we were trying to do was to create a website that was engaging, both for staff and for the public. We wanted to open it up so that more staff could contribute their knowledge and expertise and share it regularly with our patrons online. And we also wanted to make sure that we could offer new services and programs to our patrons online and new services through our web platform and also engage them. We added comments through blogging, we have polls, we have um, 
we have a poll right there right now, which I think, oh no, that's not the one that's up there right now. The one, yeah, it is Steven Tyler still up there as of this morning. Um, and then we also do quizzes. And all of it is to try to engage our patrons, both virtually and in person, around our collections, our programs, and our services. This sounds like a great idea, but this was a very different approach to how libraries were um, servicing their patrons when I first came on. So when I came to the library, I was charged with doing a cultural change around this new web platform on the back end, and then also trying to get our patrons to embrace it when it was launched. It was an incredible experience. I have to say that everything I learned in the Masters of Learning and Organizational Change program, I had to pull out every single toolkit I think we ever learned, and then I made up some more um, to try to um, pull people along on this change. You know, Our website had been around for 10 years, People may not have liked it, but they knew it. They were familiar with it. Um, as some people said, it wasn't the greatest, but at least I knew, <laughs> somebody's just like, I don't even know where my hand goes. It just goes and it just clicks. I'm not even sure what I click on anymore, but it goes exactly where I want to go. And now people had to figure out how to relearn how do you place a hold? How do you, um, how do you find a book? Um, how do you reserve a computer? Because all those things changed, right? And so we had to work with not only our staff and how to help them get through the change, we had to help our staff get through, help our patrons get through the change. And so it was just a really interesting um, kind of change platform, and it's um, a change, change management, um, what do you call it, case study. And it's one that we've used over and over and over again as um, I've worked at Chicago Public Library over the last five years. The other thing that we did is we um, introduced a lot of digital content. I hope you guys are using some of this, but um, RG Ditto Digital, Flipster, Zinio, Mango, Overdrive, these are all digital platforms. Uh, Mango is how to learn a language. Zinio and Flipster have online magazines. Um, RG Ditto Digital um, is audiobooks and Overdrive, not audiobooks, e, um, audio, yeah, audiobooks. And Overdrive is ebooks. So you get not anything you can actually, not everything, but things you can get in the library for in physical format are now becoming more and more available online. Again, this was also kind of a change uh, with the library that we had to help both our patrons and our staff get over because they are things that aren't really completely under our control. These are all cloud-based systems. And so you know how cloud-based works. It's wonderful because enhancements can be made every day. And again, that is the flip side. The most horrible thing about cloud computing is that changes are made every day. And you're trying, staff are learning things on the fly as they're also trying to help our patrons learn things on the fly, which is, you know, when you have a lot of things going on, that's a lot to keep up with. Um, another thing that we've been working on heavily at um, the library and also went through kind of a major change was digitizing our archival collections. We have um, three special collections. We have one in Harold Washington. We have one at Woodson called the Vivian Harsh Collection. And then we have the Northside Neighborhood Collection at Salzer. And um, each of those libraries was kind of doing their own thing when it came to special collections. And so some would put a priority on digitizing and some were putting more on um, other areas of how they were doing their outreach with collections. And um, so what we decided to do when I came on board, and again, this was a change of getting all these groups to work together, is we're now trying to strategically identify and um, digitize our special collections so that our special collections are representative of the communities for which we represent. Again, that goes back to that strategic priority that we talked about, which is the strengthening communities and access for all. So people don't always have to come to the library. They now can access many of our special collections online, and we are um, continuing to add more and more. Our biggest one right now is the Park District gave us their archive, and we've been digitizing and digitizing and digitizing a lot of those images, and um, most of them are now available online. Okay. Um, my talk today was actually supposed to be about library as the hub, right? Uh, library as this community organization, and so I like to look at libraries as the on-ramp. We like to introduce people to new technologies or even old technologies that they think are new. And we introduce them, we give them a chance to play with it and learn with it. And if it's something that they truly engage with, we then encourage them to go other places that have it, um, have, they can go really do that deep dive. And one example of this is the Maker Lab. Um, so the library had a Maker Lab, I don't have it here, okay. Um, it has a Maker Lab that um, we opened up in 2013 with an IMLS grant. We opened it up so that um, we could introduce um, making technologies, so 3D, um, 3D printers, visualization software, all that kind of stuff, uh, to our user group. You know, the, the city is becoming a digital manufacturing hub, and we wanted to introduce these ideas in a way that was accessible to the general public. 
when people really like it or really get into it and think this is something that they might want to do either really explore deeply as a, um, on a personal scale or they want to do it more on a career path, the library then acts as a hub where we help connect them to people and organizations for which they can then go and do that deep dive. So at the Maker Lab community, we then, if they're in the north, we put them in the north district and we find places for them to go there. If they're in the south, there's a Maker Lab that we introduce them to there. We've, um, we've done field trips and um, events so that people can go and learn about the programs at the uh, Chicago's community colleges. Um, so the library is this place where we like to introduce people to the technology and get them really engaged with it. And if they are really engaged with it, we like to help make a personal connection, if possible, to other organizations in the community where they can actually um, delve deeper. We can't provide that deep dive in everything, nor do I think we want to, because there's other organizations in the community that can do it really well. And so we see ourselves as a place that's that connector. Um, one area that we spend a lot of time working on, this is a big part of what I do, is the digital divide. A third of the citizens of Chicago do not have access uh, to um, the internet. We have people who still don't believe or don't think that uh, the internet is relevant to them and therefore don't use it regularly or don't have access to a computer or other technologies other than their cell phone um, at their home. And I'm finding that still many people in certain communities don't even have um, a smartphone. They're still using, if they're using the life safety phones, they are, um, they are, uh, don't even have internet access on them. So the library's been spending a lot of time on trying to make sure that we have access for all when it comes to public technologies. And here's a map of um, the broadband adoption of the, li of, of the city of Chicago from 2013. And so we've been working actively on trying to increase people's engagement with um, digital technologies um, in every community of the city of Chicago. And here are the goals that we're trying to do, um, trying to support when it comes to digital, um, digital adoption in the city of Chicago. Um, one way we do that is through public computing. Right now we have over 2,800 public computers in all 80 locations. Well, you know, you know what I'm saying, like the 80 have the divided by 200 and 2,800 um, are out there right now. And um, this is one way in which people have, um, can come to the library and actually use our computers. If they have computers themselves but don't have um, internet access, we also have free Wi-Fi in every city location. Um, if they need help, we have um, what we call digital skill coaches, which are cyber navigators. And patrons can sign up for a one-on-one -on -one coaching session with a computer technologist who will actually help them answer their needs, whether it's how do I create an email account um, or how do I apply for a job. We have people that will sit down with them and provide one-on-one -on -one coaching on how to um, use uh, online resources and services. Once they work with a cyber navigator, we then encourage them to use this platform called um, Chicago Digital Learn. It's an online platform that helps reinforce the skills that they're learning with the cyber navigators. Um, if they want to remember how do they how do they log into their email account, we have uh, videos on that. We have videos on how to apply for jobs. We have videos on how to use a Windows 10 computer. So when people come to the library, they can experience it once, and then they can go back here and get refresher courses um, on these different digital skills um, when they need it on demand. And finally, we're also doing what we call the Internet to Go program. I don't know if you know about this, but in 13 locations, we're actually circulating hotspots. Um, we have about 950 in circulation, and patrons can check them out for three weeks at a time, and they can then have Internet in their home. Um, we are circulating, nine, as I said, 950, and then some are also kits, which um, are a combination of a, a, a hotspot and a Chromebook. We've circulated um, these devices over 14,000 times and it's still continuing to grow. That number is actually from November, so I'm not quite sure where we're at right now. So one of the things that the Chicago Public Library is trying to do is we're trying to be innovative, and we did a collaboration with um, IDO and Aarhus Public Library with grant funding from um, the uh, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to figure out how to use design thinking so that we could more quickly prototype and test ideas in, uh, with our public to introduce new program services and operations in the library. And the outcome of that was actually to create this toolkit called the Design Thinking for Libraries. Um, and we created a toolkit that is meant for libraries to prototype quickly new services and programs for our patrons. Um, and how many here do you actually know what human centered design is? Many of you, right? So the way that we're designing is we actually are partnering with our patrons to actually develop new services and programs. Um, this is the model that we use. It's, you have an idea, you learn about the idea in the inspiration phase, you test the idea, 
Um, you start to test that idea in ideation, and then you um, continue to iterate and change that idea, and then hopefully get to scale with that new idea. I love it because you're trying to find something that's both viable, feasible, and desirable before you actually put something out into scale uh, for the public, right? So I love it because it manages both not just what the patron desires, but what you can actually feasibly do in your organization. And we do this because we, we believe that we, you know, our patrons are our customers, and we want to make sure that we're um, so serving them effectively, and that the way that we're serving them is adapting to how our communities are changing. Because what was happening a year ago may be different than what's happening this year. And so we use this approach, um, design thinking, to actually prototype and test new experiences. Now, the Finch robot happened before we did design thinking, um, but um, actually we're using it now for how we're actually teaching programming in the library. So we do programming classes for both children and teens and adults in different circumstances. Um, as I talked about before, we also have the Maker Lab. The Maker Lab was actually a design project that we did at the library. It was one of the first ones. We were actually doing it as we were developing the toolkit. And then again, as I mentioned before, this is a place where people can learn make technologies. It's, um, there's a formal space for it at Harold Washington Library Center. And then we do pop-up locations in branches throughout the library system where people can then learn and be introduced to the different making technologies. We also have what we call U Media. This is constantly using design thinking to iterate and change and service, uh, serve um, our teen population. It's a di digital media lab where teens can go and explore and learn on their own um, things that they are most passionate about. Um, we love, I love this program because it's, I have an in, if, if I were a teen, I would say I have an interest in this. And then we help them explore and better understand whatever that interest is so that they can choose whether or not they want to explore it further. And many become experts in it. So we have video production, audio production, podcasting. We've had a lot of musicians that have come out of um, uh, U Media. Um, and so it's a, it's a great place where students collaborate, work together, hang out, and then also learn digital skills with um, the help of librarians as well as other type of mentors and coaches who are experts in their field. So photography, videography, art, fashion, so on and so forth. And they all work together um, to help the teens explore their interests um, in a self-directed way. The library is now working on trying to introduce newer technologies to the population. Um, virtual reality is one of them. The, um, you know, the devices are still kind of expensive for many people to have in their own homes right now. There's also a lot of choices and people don't know what actually is the best one for them. So right now we're doing pop-up programming, introducing our patrons to virtual reality. Um, it's, it's been a very fun project. It's one I've gotten to work on. Um, I've enjoyed playing with the headsets. Um, I now no longer get nauseous when I play them. Um, it took a little while. <laughs> uh, um, and I still will not go on a roller coaster. I don't like them in person. I have found I also don't like them in a virtual experience. <laughs> Heights are heights, <laughs> whether they are real or not, according to my head. So um, right now, we're just looking at ways that we can introduce people to newer technologies, and virtual reality is one of them. We're now also starting to explore augmented reality, and how can we support and introduce the idea of augmented reality to our patrons. We have a two-prong approach with this one. It's one is we want to introduce the technology to our patrons, but we also are beginning to think that we can actually enhance and augment the services that we're offering in the library to enhance the experience of some of our patrons. So this has been a kind of a fun project that we're working on very much in the early stages of how can we provide better services using augmented reality and then also how can we introduce our patrons to this idea as well. And when we introduce these ideas, we're not only introducing them to the technology, we are also introducing them to some of the other things that you need to you know, really think about, like privacy and what does this mean and what role does this play in my life and how do I balance this with other things. And so it's a really kind of an interesting way to um, really go about technology implementation in a public space. So I am now, I've, I think I've done my quick talk because I was told to shorten my, uh, my presentation up. Thank you, okay, great. Um, I thought I had 40, 30 minutes to talk and I found out I have 20, so I tried to speed right through that. Um, but um, I put the road here because I did talk about how I felt like my life had kind of been this, um, this road not taken or, in, and I don't like to think of it as the not taken. I think I had some roads planned and I'm really good that I left myself open to the opportunity of changing directions. 
I, can't, I, I still try to picture what my life would have been like if I would have become the children's librarian. Um, my life would be very different. I don't know what it would look like, um, but I just can't imagine what it would be like because of all the experiences and things I've been able to do as a technologist and librarian in libraries. And then it happened again when I made that choice of do I stay in academic libraries or do I go? Um, and so I moved into the public library um, arena and I am so glad that I did. It's been incredible to have this one-on-one -on -one engagement with the general public um, in my community and, and be in different communities and work one-on-one -on -one and in groups uh, with uh, people in each of those different communities. And moving forward, I'm not really sure where we're gonna go. Um, I love Chicago Public Library. I have a five-year plan. I've hit, that, I've hit five years, but I found out when I started at Chicago Public Library, I don't know if any of you worked in government, but I was a little optimistic about what you could get done in five years in an, uh, a government agency. Um, so I'm still actually trying to make it through that five-year plan, and I'm having a blast doing it. And honestly, there was enough on that plan to keep me going for six, seven, and eight more years. Um, so I'm hoping to uh, continue to do that and look at new ways and use design thinking and um, partnering with our communities to introduce new technologies um, to our patrons in the city of Chicago. So that's it, my brain dump of who I am and what I do at Chicago. Any questions? Does the library do any software development projects? That's a good question. So the question was, does the library do any software development projects? And the answer right now is no. We don't actually have any programmers in the library anymore. They are, um, the programmers are centralized. So we actually do, um, our, uh, we actually partner with a lot of third parties in order to do different types of development. Sometimes it's with a vendor that we currently have. Sometimes it's with um, a group that, that we don't have a partnership with but is um, willing to create something for us but we don't actually do programming in-house anymore. How did your team develop your um, strategic priorities? That's a great question. So um, I don't know, have you guys ever, there's this book called The First 60 Days, and they have, um, if anybody starts a new job in a new industry, I totally recommend that you read it. It's, oh no, I'm sorry, The First 90 Days. And um, there's one for the first 90 days in government, and the thing that it recommended was you should actually figure out what you want to do, um, like what you want to know, and then how are you gonna accomplish that? And so the first 60 days I was at uh, Chicago Public Library, I interviewed and met with all the major stakeholders in the library, um, both individuals and in groups. And I took copious amounts of notes. And then um, I did a, a mind map. I, we wrote every, every idea down on a sticky note and then started to organize it. I'm a very visual person. Um, I love, I think out loud, but I'm, I, I am also, I also need to th see things visually in order to organize and understand it. So um, I, had, I was lucky enough to get a, an intern from Allstate who had done something similar to this and she was partnered with me for 20 hours a week. And the two of us would just meet with everybody, write everything down and then talk. And then we, would, we organized everything on a wall um, and then we reorganized and reorganized and reorganized. And then, um, then I went back to some of those stakeholders and said, this is what I think I've heard and I think this is what it looks like and this is what I think we can do priority-wise, am I right? And then of course, then we reorganized again because I, didn't, I might not have heard uh, correctly the first time, and so I needed to reevaluate and change, and then I presented that plan to the senior staff, and then it was approved, um, and then it went forward, and then many of those aspects, I did this before we did the strategic plan for the library, um, and then many of those pieces were incorporated into the strategic plan when the time came. Um, I actually, I've, I've kept, I put all the sticky notes in folders and I organized each folder by its subject matter and I still have it and still pull it out every once in a while just to remind myself of what we thought we would do and then see what we have actually done. It's fun. You had an interesting list of technologies and I was just kind of curious if there are any technologies either like physical or services that people use that don't match the library's mission and then like how you deal with that. That's a good question. You know, I, moving, like, so, since I've been there, I try to only implement technologies that support their strategic plan or our strategic initiatives, and I try to pick ones that support and usually in at least two different areas. I mean, um, we're a lean and mean shop, so we have to be really careful and, uh, in what it is that we select and decide to move forward with, um, and so, I have to say that I can't really think of a product that we've, product or service that we've tried to go forward with that didn't support 
the strategy. I'm also not one to implement a technology just for the technology's sake. I like to look at what the technology is. So like we are doing virtual reality, but um, we didn't move forward with it until we could understand why we wanted to do it. So it's not just introducing the technology, but we also usually have goals of which we're trying to um, meet when we introduce the new technologies, if that makes sense. We have insights and themes and what we want to accomplish with that. And so we design our programs with technology around what our internal outcomes are um, and then figure out how best to achieve that through the chosen technology platform. Does that make sense? I, I honestly can't think of one. I'm sure something's gonna come to me in the middle of the night when I wake up at two o'clock going, oh, that would have been a great idea. And if I do, I will tweet it out. <laughs> Why did you uh, do the 3D printing stuff? Like, what is the educational outcome from that? Ah, great question. So um, at that point, this was 2013, and um, I don't remember, so this was during the Obama administration, and there was a recovery um, act that was going on, and as part of, I think this is part of the recovery act, right, was um, they were trying to create hubs in certain communities. And the city of Chicago was named a manu digital manufacturing hub. And um, so we knew we wanted to support that idea in some way, shape, or form in the city of Chicago. And the way we thought we could best do that was to introduce people to what is digital manufacturing. But if you say that's what exactly, like if you use that terminology, people wouldn't really come most likely into the library because they don't understand really what that phrase means. So what we said is what we were, what we were doing is we were introducing people to making technologies. And we were introducing them to 3D and 2D modeling and um, digital design and um, I can't think of, there was one other thing that was really the other reason why we did it, and it will come to me again, as I said later. Um, but we decided that that's what we wanted to introduce people to, because that, those, are, those are skill sets and needs that we have in digital manufacturing, and actually that we really have in this current digital economy, right? You know, these skill sets are things that people may not have learned when they were in school, um, especially if you're not currently in high school or college. Um, but people are always continually reinvent, re reinventing themselves in the workforce. And we wanted to introduce people to the options and the alternatives to new career paths that they may not know currently exist. So the Maker Lab to us was a way to introduce and onboard people into this community, because it was it's a community that is active, but it's I find a little bit closed because it's you have to know people, you have to know it already. And what we did is we introduced people to it and we gave them a skill set so that when they went to the more um, established maker communities in the city of Chicago, they already had some of the skill sets needed in order to join those different organizations, whether that was an actual maker lab or whether that was actually going to school to get uh, to further, maybe get a certificate and or a degree um, in those areas. Does that answer your question? Okay. Just to piggyback off that, um, does the library put those maker spaces in educational spaces that already exist, or are they at the library only? Like, do, do they, you know, appear in schools, for example? Um, so schools have their own maker labs. Many of them do. Um, we, the library, we have the one set one, which is at the Harold Washington Library Center, and then we've popped up in different locations. Um, we'll do anywhere between three, and uh, three, I'm sorry, six weeks to um, uh, three months in a specific location. Right now we're um, on hold because we're trying to reevaluate if we might want to change any of the technologies that we currently have. Um, and we have some uh, branches that are getting refreshed that will actually open up with some of that technology built in. Teen Services also has this technology in their U Media spaces and in some of the teen spaces as well. So. Um, the Maker Lab is more for adults, and then we have this technology in the teen spaces. And now Children's is doing, um, has been um, updating and creating early learning spaces uh, and tween spaces. And in those tween spaces, we now are also including um, uh, some of the maker technologies in and programming related to that in those in those spaces. Now, sometimes the maker space for us is a physical space. So, like at Harold Washington, it literally is a room that you walk into. Um, in many places, what we're doing is it's more of a programmatic space. So, this day we have making we have a making program, whatever it may be. It may be programming, maybe three D modeling, it may be you know printing, it may be um, uh, uh, the cutters, the um, 
Thank you. The laser cutter, so we can make uh, different types of things. We've had vinyl cutters, so uh, we find a lot of people come in and like test and prototype their um, designs to see how it would look when it was actually not just on a piece of paper, but put on things um, for new companies that they might be creating. But um, one of the things that we're trying to do, and I, maybe I'm not getting this across very well, is there's already a pretty well-established maker community in the city of Chicago. It's very robust. It's um, you know, there's, there's several in the north the district, um, for, like in the north, there's some in the middle, in the central, there's some in the south. And so what we saw ourselves doing is we wanted to make sure that people could learn it in a safe environment in a way that, um, that they felt okay to fail. And people are very trusting of libraries. They, they, will, they're like, they will come in and tell us something, like, I don't know how to do this, and they trust that we will help them figure it out. And that's what we do with the maker technology in any technology, virtual reality, augmented reality, public computing. And then we work with them side by side so that they can help build those skills and get really comfortable with it and then feel like then they can make that decision about what is it that they want to do next. And if they tell us what they want to do next is they want to get more engaged with this and they want to go further with it and learn how to use other tools and pieces of equipment, our space is only so big. Um, and therefore, then what we do is we literally help bring them into those communities and introduce them. We will sometimes have um, field trips and open houses with uh, different maker communities in the city of Chicago. Um, sometimes one of our staff will just bring them on up and say, hey, I know you're, you're really good at this. I think you're ready for the next step. Let me introduce you to a couple of people there and bring them there and introduce them to people so that when they go there the next time, there's somebody that they know they can say hi to. And then that makes them feel comfortable if that makes sense. So we really try to, um, when I say the library is an on-ramp, we help on-ramp them to the technology, we on-ramp them into their interests, um, we on-ramp them into whatever it is that they want to discover, and then we determine whether or not that on-ramp stays in the library, You know, whether we can have them go to other places in the library to continue to explore and learn, or whether or not we need to use our relationships in our communities, either through um, our individual relationships or the relationships that have been built by other branches in, this, in, our, in our library system. And then they then help make that connection to them. We don't want to recreate and take over something that another organization is doing really well. If you're really good at something, we want to celebrate that you're really good at it. And then we hope that you will allow us to introduce our users to you um, so that you can then take them on the next part of that journey. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so you briefly mentioned that you had some difficulties with the redesign of the website and then introducing new programs, uh, both with the staff and the patrons. Could you talk more about the challenges and insights that you gained through that? Sure. Yeah. So um, I don't know if anybody here has ever like looked at like uh, like how you do organizational change, but um, so we we you know I I I really feel like I just. Um, almost took like a template out of a book and just started kind of filling it out. But you know, first what you did is you found those early adopters, those people that you knew would um, totally get on board with the change, that they're always on board with the change, that they wanted things to change. And we got them on board and we got them to become ambassadors. Um, and then they started talking it up to, to staff and using their relationships with people in uh, the library system and talking it up. But that's only gonna get you so far. So then what we needed to do is we need to get the next group of people who once enough people came on board or were talking about it enough, they were willing to then listen to us. And so then we would actually go out and individually talk to them. There was a small team of us that would slowly try to get the next group on board and then the next group. And then, then it finally got to them. We just finally had to go out to all the branch managers. So we had specific training for all the branch managers so that they could get comfortable and familiar with it. So that they, and then not only with the tool, but also how do you help them help their staff get through the change, because they're learning it themselves, but then they also have to help their staff get through the change. There's only so much I can do. I can't be in every 80 locations every day, hand-holding and helping everybody go through that change. I need ambassadors that will help people get through that change. And so one of the major um, aspects I thought that I needed to do as part of this change, as well as many other changes that we've done, is help the different people who would be supervising or leading that change get them comfortable not only with the technology itself, but with how do you help people give up what they know, mourn it, accept it, and then celebrate the change, if that makes sense. And so I spent a lot of time, 
I learned a lot with that one. And then when we, um, about a year and a half ago, I don't know if you guys remember this, but um, you guys couldn't renew or check out books for about a week. Um, so what was happening is we were actually migrating our entire back-end system that we use to manage almost every library. Anything related to circulation, checking out, cataloging, all that kind of stuff. We migrated to a new system. We'd been on the old system for over 10 years. And so things, lessons I learned from launching the website, I did well. I, there were areas that our group could do better. And thankfully, we took really good notes on what we could do better and what we did really well with that first change. And we were able then to uh, reapply that to the second change. And I spent even more time with um, not only the branch managers, who's a huge group, but um, we have a lot of like, um, I don't know how to, I'll, I'll say it like affinity groups or communities of practice that are in the library that people that are, you know, like the catalogers and um, people who do serials and people who do uh, training. And so then I also worked with those leaders so that they could then help not only their branch managers, but then they were getting that reinforcement from the other groups that they were going to to do their work in order to get the support that they needed. One of the other things that's really helpful to get them through the change um, was making sure that they had the answers ahead of time for what patrons were going to ask them and how they could respond to them when they didn't have the answers. And that's what I don't think I did a very good job with the first time when we did the library's website launch. Is we, had like a, we had a list of what we thought all the questions we were going to get asked and I never gave them the answer of what they should tell patrons when it wasn't on the list and they didn't know. And so people don't, our staff, want to help people get what they want, right? They don't want to say, I don't know. Or if they say, I don't know, they want to be able to then go, but she does, <laughs> right? And sometimes we didn't have all that information right now because we just didn't think that somebody was going to ask that or want that. And so um, with our, when we did this last change of migrating our backend system, I made sure that we also had answers that people could give that when they didn't know the answer and then how to, how to point that person to the person to get that help. And what we did is we created a bank of people that could triage and troubleshoot and then figure out who was the best person to answer that. So it's a, it's a learning curve. I mean, I've, I've, I feel like I'm well rooted in, in these major change initiatives, and yet every time I do it, I still learn something new. And that was one of the things that I could have done better as a leader the first time was helping people when they couldn't answer the question. And I think we did better with that the second time. So does that answer? Okay. So I was curious, um, does the CPL, I guess, collect any data on how patrons consume information? And if so, are there any surprising trends that you found? Um, and also, how are you guys using this data to improve uh, the libraries? Yeah, that's a good question. So libraries and data. Um, so this isn't, I don't know, if you guys are really ever interested in data in libraries, you should do some searching on this, because there's a really interesting debate going on right now. Libraries have always been about protecting patron privacy, right? Um, we want to make sure that when patrons come in, they can ask and they can explore and learn something and no one's going to judge them and nobody can come back to them later and say, you are interested in X and, and somehow that getting out, right? So, you know, a child exploring something about who it is that they really are, or that they want to be able to do that in a way that's um, safe and they know that it's only they know. Um, however, in this changing time that we're going through, and it's not even really changing, I mean, it's been like this for you know, the last 15 years, is that people in the general web community are expecting certain types of things. You know something about me, and therefore, because of that, I want you to do certain things for me. And so um, the reason I'm, I guess I'm bringing this up is that we're, we have information that's interesting, but we never really tie it to specific people. Does that make sense? And so I, the, I as a librarian, I wish I had more information, but then as a, as a technologist, I wish I had the more information. As a librarian, I'm glad I can't tie it to an individual person. Um, the one, the, there's two trends, though, that I'm finding really interesting, is that um, many libraries circulation is, is staying stagnant, and ours is going up. Um, and um, it was a thought it was because people were just redoing their books more often, because we've made it easier for them to do that. Um, and we're finding it's actually, while yes, renewals are going up, it's not, making up for the full increase of circulation. So it looks like general circulation is actually growing, which is um, a trend that I'm actually starting to hear about from other librarians. It's not a huge increase. I mean, I'm saying like it was only like a one or two percent, but people keep saying that the library is dead um, and there's some are celebrating that fact. I would, I, I yell at them um, and I have 
choice words, which I will not say because I'm being recorded. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, it's just nice to see that there's this trend that it's growing. The thing, the other really interesting trend, and we're not the only ones that are seeing this in libraries, but the publishing industry as a whole is seeing um, people are going back to the print book. And I went to a really interesting talk at um, uh, CES. They were um, talking about millennials and um, the Gen Z, right? Is that the year? That's the group that's younger than millennials, right? Yeah. And they were finding that they were trying, that many of them were going back for long form reading back to physical items and not ebooks, right? I like ebooks because my eyesight's getting worse every year. And um, my bifocals can only do so much, so I read online because I can make the text bigger. They, of course, don't have this problem. But what they were saying is in their research, and I don't know if their research is right or not, but I am seeing a growing trend in this, is that um, they like reading the physical book because they're disconnected. They don't get distracted. So they can have this moment in time. They can say, I want to read this book. I want to engage in it. I want to think about it thoughtfully. Um, I want to explore it, and the only way I know I can do that is if I disconnect in some way, shape, or form. And that's really hard to do on a device. And I will say that I know when I read a book, I probably go a chapter and then like have to check Twitter, check my email, uh, check my IM, see what's happening, making sure everything's still alive in the world. Um, and so I, I, I do get this, and then, um, I, it's an interesting trend. I mean, e-books are still getting used. Um, it's not like it's a dying entity. I don't think it will just because, you know, it's so convenient to always have your, your book on you wherever you go. I mean, I always have at least 30 or 40 books on here, so if whatever I'm reading isn't interesting to me now, I can just go to the next one. And you really can't carry three or four books around with you and still have a decent back. Um, but um, I'm, I'm really intrigued to see what's gonna happen with print. I, you know, people also say print is dead, long li you know, and uh, long live digital. And, I'm finding it really interesting to see this increase or not the decrease of usage in print materials. Interesting enough, one other thing too I will just say is that we're actually seeing an increased engagement on our library's website with blogs, quizzes, and um, polls. So um, for the first year or two, people didn't really want to um, comment on our blogs. We would sometimes get comments on our webmaster email because there was a link at the bottom and they'd be like, I love this blog. It's just like, say that in the blog. Um, <laughs> um, but now people are actually blogging and we don't have to plant anybody anymore. Sometimes we would just have one a staff member go in and type something if we were getting emails about it so that other people then would feel comfortable uh, commenting. Um, and now we're actually seeing like little bits of dialogue going on um, that way, in that way. And, that are, people are really having a, a, a great time. I, I, I love making them, so I'm glad that they enjoy reading them, is our quizzes, where we do quizzes about what's going on in, the, in what, something that's big that's happening right now, and then doing that and then connecting with our collections related to that. So we've done like Harry Potter, and um, I do most of the Star Wars and Star Trek. Um, I also do many of the sports ones, because I'm also the, one of the few people that um, in our small group that really likes sports. Um, but we do it around all different types of things, and so we use it to engage people around a topic, but then also try to re-energize them around that co a collection that relates to that topic as well. Thanks. <laughs>